even in the summer months, you can watch our live cast every workday at 8.30 p.m. Be inspired and discover new perspectives at Pakhuis de Zwijger. A very warm welcome to you for the 14th edition for of We Make the City Reset from now on, according to Gabriela Gomez Mont. It's a, a live cast from Pakhuis Weiger, and there's also a special welcome today for our viewers who are watching us through Salto. Um, summer is here. It seems very happy. Uh, the regulations concerning the intelligent lockdown are being lifted, but at the same time, in other places in, in Europe, uh, infections co of COVID-19 are flaring up again. Um, it's a confusing time, and as well as we can, we're trying to return to the new normal, whatever that is. Is that life as we know it before COVID-19 hit? Um, or is it something else? Or can we take the space to think about a complete reset? Can we review dysfunctional systems that are there in society and change them around for the better to have a more sustainable future. Um, in this series of programs we invite uh, several thought leaders to have their own perspective on the situations we're dealing with today and they will do that through the area of their own expertise but always with an emphasis on design and creativity. Our main guest today, and I'm very happy is she's here, is Gabriela Gomez Mont. And later on, we will jo be joined by Jana Tavanir. Jana is the co founder and executive director of Fine Acts, and that's a global platform for socially engaged creative solutions. But now, I would like to welcome Gabriela Gomez Mont on stage. A welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us. If you could use the mic, then we can all hear you. Um, you're the founder and former director of award-winning Laboratorio para Ciudad, and now you're in the process of launching Experimentalista. That is correct. In two sentences, because we're going to talk about that a little bit later. What is Experimentalista? Experimentalista will be a new approach to bridging creativity and urban practices, basically. Oh, well, I'm very curious to hear mm. about that a little bit later on. <laughs> but the first question I'd like to pose to you is that um, how do you think that Corona has impacted the role of imagination in the city? Well, I have the feeling that we are in an incredibly interesting as well as problematic point in time because there has been a narrative breakdown of sorts. So basically, I think that many things that we knew for certain or we thought we knew for certain are right now a little bit more liquid so to speak. So I have the feeling that we, many things we need to come to anew. There's old questions that we've never figured out. And there's also old questions that we had to figure out a way forward that now we need to revisit everything from how do we think about public space? How do we think about participation? How do we think about urban practices? So right now, I believe that uh, the potential, if you will, is that in terms of that narrative breakdown, the future that we imagine will be a sort of cultural battle, if you will, between people that want to speed back into the world as we knew it, that we know is no longer sustainable. And at the same time, the potential to reimagine anew, to really go forward in different ways and know that we can sometimes backtrack, sometimes swerve, sometimes do some strange turns and twirls in the air to actually get ourselves into a very different space socially in terms of our cities, our societies, etc. Right. And there's a saying that um, in Dutch that says uh, under pressure, everyth everything turns liquid. So everything is possible. Um, you know, a week ago, we almost had the feeling that, you know, the COVID-19 threat um, was gone, that we could resume our life again as we knew it. Now, in Belgium, for example, there's, uh, you know, the suspic suspicion of, of having a second wave of infections. So the pressure is on again. Um, this is a very insecure situation where we have to deal with. Um, are we capable of making sustainable uh, decisions or decisions for a sustainable future in, when the times are as, confuse, as confusing as they are? I think it's difficult. There's definitely a lot of pressure, but I do think that, as they say in politics, one should never let a good crisis go to waste. So how do we actually work with this? I have the feeling that the other... A possible story, if you will, if we had never gone through what we're going through now as the world, is more of this uh, metaphor of the boiling frog, if you will. If, you know, when you, you throw a frog in tepid water and you start boiling it slowly, 
the frog doesn't necessarily feel as the myth goes or the reality goes, the change of heat. And so basically you end up in a not very happy place. Right now I have the feeling that we're all feeling the heat, if you will. And even though there is a pressure, I think even a cognitive pressure of, of withstanding so much ambiguity really is stressful and in, in, even traumatic, and especially for people that are really feeling the brunt of, of everything that, we're happen that is happening right now. But so how do we actually take this to really reimagine the future that awaits with many different perspectives and other roads that we could go down. So uh, yes, it is hard. And at the same time, I feel that this is perhaps the heat that we needed as, a, as, as a, a planetary heat that is not even geographically located in one place or another, but that really for the first time involves us all, where we are feeling our own externalities, like we can't push it into another country, across another border, but we are all feeling it in our day-to-day life so what do we do with this right well that is the question what do we do with this and how can we make society for example more democratic because there's this suspicion that um through the use of the corona app um and through the forces of of, of being controlled um societies are becoming less and less democratic is that fear justified so that's actually a really great question because I do think that many of the choices that we make now are going to create what we call in urbanism path dependency. So the, the pieces that we put into place now with the, that liquidity that, you, that we mentioned uh, beforehand, we will start figuring out what pieces to put into place, what gets articulated with what, and that actually might last decades into the future, which is why I think that it becomes so urgent for us to make the right choices and also to bring in an incredibly... Uh, multifaceted imagination into the things that we're living in right now. So I think that that is definitely possible. I hear that there's um, slightly suspect companies that are behind some of the data gathering in Europe, for example. And at the same time, I feel uh, that cities such as Amsterdam, where we are, I know that they're going for donut economics and rethinking tourism and rethinking circular economy. So I have the feeling that both stories will be true. And this is exactly why I feel that this narrative breakdown really requires for all of us to be very vocal about the type of cities and societies that we want and weigh, weighing perhaps the balance towards the future and not necessarily get trapped in the crises, urgency of the present because of this. Because I think everything will be true at once. <laughs> because we need some guidance. What we saw, for example, in the red light district that during the crisis and during the lockdown, you saw neighbors sitting next to each other on the street in a very quiet area. Now you can see that tourists already returned to the red light district. And it seemed like the pandemic never happened because it's as crowded and as busy as it was before that. So how do we, you know, when we return to the situation that we know, how can we still steer it towards a more livable society? It's funny that you mentioned the red light district because that's actually where I'm staying. I was only passing through Amsterdam for five days, supposedly on my way to London and Lisbon for work. And four months later, I'm still here. And I'm actually staying at one of the little houses on the Udekirk compound. Uh. So I have seen this happen uh, around me. Um, and it was really interesting in terms of the lockdown of suddenly seeing that public space became a very intimate sphere. Like all of my neighbors and people around there would bring their tables out and have lunch on the patio and take over the edges of the canal. So it, when the social distancing started easing up again, you would see two people, you know, this very intimate, very delicious circle, which redefines, if you will, publicness. And in the last week, the, yes, the hordes of tourists are back. So I actually think that this is, this is uh, having had a taste of one possible avenue. How do we actually create a, a space where we can debate and talk about the futures that we can imagine together? Like, how do we think about those urban imaginaries that we will then step into? So I don't think it's a given. I think that there will be pros and cons for everything. Uh, but some of the work that I did in Mexico City while I was a chief creative officer was precisely about this. Like, when you have contested views of what the future holds and what our cities should be for each of us, how do we actually create a space that perhaps will not be easy because you know democracy is full of tensions and it will be especially full of tensions, I think, while there's such big discussions are, are being had, but we actually need to sit and decide as a society where we want to go individually and collectively. That conversation is quite important mm -hmm. and very 
uh, important to have to see a, a good future for the city. Um, we will return to that conversation later, but now you prepared a presentation for I us. I did, I did. I would like to say the floor is yours. Absolutely, thank you so much. So what would happen if we built cities not only for the human body, but also for the human imagination? I come from Mexico City, a, um, a city that is a good point in case and a great starting point to talk about imagination. Uh, it was founded when the traveling Aztecs found this site, a serpent being eaten by an eagle landing on, upon a nopal. And they had traveled decades to find the sign and they knew that that was exactly where they needed to build the new civilization. And it didn't matter that they found the space on a lake in a little island. They actually went on to build what was in the 1400s when the Spaniards arrived, one of the largest cities of the world, a place of palaces, a place of incredibly sophisticated aqueducts and floating islands that had solved everything from agriculture to urbanism for this incredibly specific typology. So basically they not only worked with imagination, but they also defied the possibilities of their reality. This is Mexico City now, and I think uh, it is still a place, as you can see, that defies <laughs> imagination as well. Uh, it is a place where we can still see these beautiful castles right in the middle of parks, in city parks, that are this one, Chapultepec Park, that is three times larger than Central Park. It is a place where modernism is alive and well. This is Reforma that was modeled after Paris's Champs-Élysées and the Hausmann, Hausmann ideal. But this is also Mexico City, a city that is 60% self-constructed and a city that actually changes every day because of the pop-up markets, the cultural manifestations, the way that the citizens have it really co-created the city that we live in. So imagination is not a luxury. All of our urban and social realities, we are creating a little by little, a lot by a lot together. So I had a really interesting opportunity uh, in 2013 when I was invited to be the chief creative officer for Mexico City and found Laboratorio para la Ciudad, which was the experimental arm slash creative think tank for the Mexico City government. There, we had the opportunity to ask ourselves this question, can we imagine a city from a different space? I led a young, very talented team that was highly multidisciplinary. Um, uh, there was everything from political scientists, urban geographers, AI experts, civic tech experts, to philosophers, artists, historians, writers, futurists, etc. thinking about the city, everything from the theoretical to the practical and how we landed our ideas of the city into a reality made visible. Um, so this time here at the lab really gave me a taste for how important it is to bring the humanities back into the conversation of cities just because imagination is actually so important. So at the lab, one of the things that we did continuously was really think about what do these objective typographies, topographies of the city look like, you know, our, our objective data, our physical city, but how do we also think about social imaginaries and the subjective city and the way that mind anchors to matter? And this, in a sense, I have the feeling we could speak about the symbolic infrastructure of the city that becomes incredibly important when we think about imagination and the realities that will then surge from there. Uh, this is the main square in Mexico City, Zócalo. Underneath all of those colonial buildings, there's actually an Aztec city. And um, I show this picture of Spencer's Turnick intervention many years back because I, fi I, I find it quite interesting to speak about that those intangibles and that symbolic infrastructure. What you see there are 18,000 smiling butts looking happily up at you. Um, so this was obviously a world record. And it was incredibly interesting because this became, as you can imagine, a day of celebration because we broke yet another world record. And it also became a place of collaboration, but that very quickly turned into a space of contestation. Because at one point in time, Spencer Turnick decided to only have uh, the women in the photograph and ask the men to go back, get dressed, and only the women remained. And suddenly this, pla this place of celebration actually became tension filled. And we saw a social dynamic unfolding that very much speaks to the reality of Mexico in general and of a very intense gender structures because then the cat calling started, the whistling started, et cetera, et cetera. And the complete culture of the square 
changed into something incredibly different. Uh, that same sc city square has seen everything from huge concerts, one of them by Justin Bieber. So you see that this same space filled by 14 year olds and their parents. It has become the parking lot of the presidential palace that is part of this city square. It has become a place where the quinceañeras or 15 year olds celebrate uh, their birthday it has become a place for collective marriages. It has become a place where the women took over the place some, some, some months ago to protest that there are almost 11 women being killed every day across Mexico. And it is also a place not only of those aggressions and those manifestations, but also of the subtleties. This is a picture by artist Francis Alis, where he showed how even that simple shadow on a very sunny day in Mexico City creates its own human architecture. Um, funnily enough, this was actually the city square many years back. And even though it was a beautiful park, I also find that in a certain sense, there wasn't as many interesting things happening there. So this for me is something that becomes really interesting when talking about imagination at an urban scale. Can we create policy to sign a possibility? Can we just be able to manifest that here is a space to be filled and also let society be part of that conversation? Um, we had a really interesting search in Mexico City when we, we wanted to know about urban imaginary. So we, we asked 31,000 people across 1,400 neighborhoods to imagine the future of Mexico City. And even though we were prompting for positive futures, we basically got back Mad Max dystopic notions of what the city would become in the future. Should government care about this? Should policy care about this? I think so, because again, I, I have the feeling that policy should also be world hinting. So there's many ways I think that we could go about this from the very specific and artistically based projects such as Gilberto Esparza, who's one of Mexico City's most talented artists. This is a project of his called Nomad Plants. This is a real thing that is a, a hybrid between a robot and a plant. And it has hydrophilic legs, which means that it can actually sense the humidity in the land and walk towards rivers. And then it has a straw that you see there that actually drinks the water of the river, uh, is able to clean it because it takes for granted that urban rivers are polluted. That feeds the plant and the plant in turn feeds the robot and it can live in the wild for up to a month. And it also runs away when somebody tries to touch it. So besides being an amazing scientific as well as artistic feat, it is also a great conversation starter because if as government you come up to these societies and say the society is living by the river, communities living by the river, and talk about policy of why it's important to clean rivers and not wash your clothes, it's one thing. When you actually arrive in these places with a little urban beast such as this, it becomes such an interesting way of starting conversations. So can we bring back the politics of the people um, with these urban imaginaries that I mentioned, we also found out what people's biggest challenges uh, were in terms of the day-to-day -day of the city, and water came up as one of the main ones. So even though the water problem is huge in Mexico City, we thought we'd take the opportunity of this um, fair that is also in the, in, that takes place in the city center, the fair of the friendly cultures, and created a pavilion for Mexico City where we were able to showcase projects done by civil society. Uh, one of the many projects that was showcased this day with about 2 million people passing through every day was a fabulous project by Isla Urbana that at that time was a very small uh, design studio that was working with communities and creating um, uh, systems to capture the, the rainwater because every day we have about a million homes without water across the city on any given day. And at the same time, we have more rainfall than places like London. Um, so that was at the time small scale, very much working with communities. Then there was also activities that we did together, such as working with the Senate. And then the fabulous news that came out some months ago was that the new government of Mexico City is actually piloting 100,000 of uh, these uh, rainwater captation systems across Mexico City. So this is how something very small community based becomes something larger. So can we go forward with these types of new artic social political articulations and create what I'd call creative governance? Um, when we were working in Mexico City, it was quite astounding to see fabulous projects surfacing across the city, such as Chavos Banda, which is one of the most 
interesting project that has taken people uh, out of out of the the gangs and 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 you know just like the 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 shadow part of the city, if you will, and into finding productive ways of of um, thinking about what they could be doing across the city, and is led precisely by people that used to be gang members and that are now actually training people in cultural activities, becoming street artists, becoming musicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's also another space um, in Mexico City where the senior citizens with participatory budgets decided to create a half day care half senior citizen home that has been incredibly successful for engaging the community around this. And so the question becomes, can we start finding and figuring out what these thermometers could look like across our cities? So it's not only a political imagination that is pointing the way forward, but that we can also take these small scale neighborhood unit projects that actually, when articulated into a wider whole and when inspiring each other, could actually become a larger system. And how do we create dynamic and creative governance around this, where it's not only uh, citizens debating, but actually the government creating platforms where it, it provokes not only horizontal government to citizen collaborations, but also, sorry, not only vertical uh, conversations of government to citizens, but also horizontal conversations of citizens to citizens. So we can create platforms such as this, such as Ciudad Propuesta, where you can suddenly showcase and actually have people being able to get in touch with them and see the, the projects that are happening across the city. Because I have the feeling that this all points to something that becomes incredibly important to think about. Utopias have a way of becoming dystopias, history has shown. But what happens with heterotopias? What happens when we have many avenues that are possible, when we have many territories of experimentation, when it's not only the big politics and the big policy that is finally the way forward, but that we have every time more people on the ground doing their own experimentation in terms of creating public value, but that can then actually be articulated into a wider whole. So how can we get the, boast of the, best, of the best of both worlds? In, in many ways, I have the feeling that this is what the right to the city points to. In terms of the philosophical concept of Henri Lefebvre and company, um, one of the definitions that I love the most is, is when they say that, you know, the right to the city, uh, the ultimate right to the city is having the citizens be able to imagine their city and then make it come true. Because first we imagine our cities and then our cities create us. So I was really happy when this precept actually made it into the constitution because it's also a very sophisticated way of dealing with human rights. And the constitution of Mexico City became precisely this. How can we actually be able to create a very uh, sophisticated and multi-layered scaffolding of participation where political imagination has its place, but we also give a place for citizens to imagine the future of Mexico City. So we crowdsourced the Mexico City Constitution, which was a first for the world, I am happy to say, that created quite a bit of, of noise across the world. And we actually had uh, citizens, normal citizens, such as Patricio, who at the time was 17 years old, uh, having their ideas now in the Constitution and asking also people from many, many walks of life to be able to add their urban imaginaries to what could be thought of as the most important document that Mexico City has in terms of defining its future. So now we have everything from euthanasia to transsexual rights to also sanctuary city and this is thanks to the Constitution of Mexico City is when the caravan Go, that passed through Mexico on the way to the US, passed through the city, why we had, instead of policemen and military receiving the caravan, we had doctors and aid and help saying hello to them was precisely because a constitution. So I leave you with that question. In terms of right now that we're seeing this narrative battle, how do we start thinking about our cities and our urban futures, not only, as I mentioned from the beginning, from the space of the human body, but also how do we create societies that will be prompting and provoking human imagination to turn into its best possibilities? Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela. It's thought provoking, it's, it's interesting. Um, and one of the topics that really spoke to me is the right to the city. Because I mentioned dysfunctional structures at the beginning of the program, I reckon that one of the dysfunctional structures is that the right of the city is determined by wealth, 
the wealthy have more right to the city than uh, other people that are not that wealthy. How can we have a systematic change in order to change that way of thinking? So I, I completely agree that that is the way that things are structured right now. And uh, when I jumped into government, one of the things that I was fascinated with was systems thinking. Because there's a very simple precept in, in systems thinking that completely blew my brain when you think about it deeply, which is that many times we think that systems are are you know we systems are wrong when they have outcomes that we don't like but actually all system is is designed to produce the results that we see so in a certain sense i have the feeling that right now the societies that we that we are creating that have designed for is exactly that it is the right to the city for the people that are at the top of the pyramid and we can definitely see that in Mexico City but I also think that there's a very different way of thinking about this so even um the work that we did in terms of of thinking about spatial justice of thinking that many times a city actually needs to be give even more public resources and and civic assets to the spaces that have the least personal resources and and individual resources i think is a, a completely different way of thinking about this because then you see that neighborhoods in some places of mexico city for example will have more than 42 square meters of green space which is as green as any of the greenest of cities and other neighborhoods actually have three square meters of, of green space and i'm actually giving you real data so then the place of government and the place of the public the, the addition of public value has to also compensate for these inequalities that exist structurally in our cities. So this is the way that I think that we need to start going forward. And I have the feeling that, uh, that what we've seen with the pandemic is that at the very least now we're starting a conversation of how important the public realm actually is. You know, universal care for everybody is actually not only in benefit of the people that cannot afford private health care, but it's also in benefit of everybody because as we now know, like one weak link in our social system is a weak link for everybody. And I would, I would say that that's always been true, right? Like, you know, the most divided and divisive societies. And I see that in Mexico city, sometimes are also many times the most tumultuous, the most dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so hopefully we will be rethinking our very frameworks. Because uh, if I understand correctly, I think that there's a, there's a bigger need of uh, a sense of solidarity in that sense. But that also means that you have to give up privileges. Uh, are people willing to give up their own privileges in order to have society, you know, turn for the better? I think the history of humanity is the history of everything at once. I think that there are people that have been very happy to do so. Um, when thinking even about um, philanthropy, we're thinking about uh, people that are willing to put their lives on the line for people sometimes that they don't even know. I think it, it really points towards the fact that it's not always the, this wild west and, and this battle of the fittest, if you will, and for, for, for individual survival. And at the same time, history shows the complete opposite. That yes, like given the right circumstances, we will do anything to come out on top. So this is actually one of the places where I find imagination so important. Like how do we actually start structuring th this um, culture, this great a priori, deep culture, where we provoke that generosity becomes a thing that we think about. And for those who perhaps are uh, a little bit less willing to be empathic and such, how do we even provoke uh, the, the, the conversation that perhaps it's even in, in your own benefit, as I mentioned, like, you know, having a proper health system right now for the people that cannot afford it is actually perhaps life-saving to you or somebody that you love, unless you want to go bunker yourself up for the next two, three years. <laughs> Imagination in that sense can play a big part in changing the narrative in order to understand it's not something you lose, but at certain times it's something you gain as well. Right, um, we will return to that conversation a little bit later, but now um, I would like to ask you, you've invited Jana Tavani to join into the conversation. Why did you ask her? Well, first of all, because I've, I've always been a huge admirer of Jana's work. And I have the feeling that we need to start entangling disciplines and entangling different ways of approaching subjects. And even though I, I find in my time in government, a policy to be an amazing tool to make reality malleable, I also know it's just the beginning of a conversation because so many times we actually need citizens to come in to do their part. So 
many times you can create a law or you can create a 200 page report and nothing happens, even though it's solid information. And what you need is actually to be able to provoke people's imagination and to get that message out in a very different way. And I have the feeling that Jana has done that in a fabulous way and, and will have some examples for us where we can see why we need to redefine creative practices and bring uh, creative people in the humanities deeper into the conversation right. of the things we care about the most. We'll engage in the conversation with her in a moment, but first we have an introductory film. Let's have a look at that. That was uh, quite an intense uh, clip where that we saw. Can you give us a little bit of context of what we just saw? Hi, Gabi. It's lovely to be here. Um, so in the summer of 2017, a woman was murdered by her partner in Sofia. The woman was um, beaten for over 15 minutes before she died. Um, and the morning after, the neighbors told the press that they heard the screams, but they didn't intervene. Um, so we decided to design an experiment. Exactly one year later, we rented the apartment underneath, uh, just below uh, uh, where the murder occurred. We placed a drum set in the living room and exactly at 10 p.m. we started beating it. You see in many societies, uh, domestic violence is uh, typically seen as a private matter. Uh, neighbors, however, are very quick to react to any other kind of noise. Uh, so if these neighbors didn't react to 50 minutes of screams from a beating, we wanted to test um, how long we will take them to react to the beating of a drum. And as you saw the answer, uh, it is 1 minute and 52 seconds. And this is when the doorbell rang. We filmed this experiment, it became instantly viral. Our campaign amplified the voices of survivors who share similar stories online. And it also equipped uh, neighbors with specific advice um, on what to do in these kind of situations and many committed to taking actions. So this is, this is the background. Um, thank you so much. I, th I think that's very confronting to, to have that um, uh, knowledge of, of people not reacting. Uh, to 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 a beating and do react to a sound. Um, we could talk a lot about this, but that's not why you invited us. Uh, why, you, uh, why we invited you? I have to say, I'm still a little upset about the film. I have to say. Um, um, let's return to the presentation that uh, Gabriela just gave. Um, what is your first reaction to that? 
Um, first of all, hi, Gabi. I'm also a huge admirer of your work, as you know. Um, I loved uh, everything that uh, all the points that Gabi made. I made notes to myself when I was listening to her. Uh, on the point of imagination, I wrote that uh, every re revolution begins with imagination and being able to visualize what isn't, um, but what, it, what can be. Um, and I think that uh, the point of Gabi that imagination is uh, not a luxury anymore is something that we all need to need to embrace. Um, Gabi and I share the common love um, of um, experimentation and building uh, playgrounds for people that are nothing like us and co-creating together. So um, I heard a lot uh, of, uh, of her points that I totally agree with. Right. Um the, the need of uh, imagination was really amplified. Um, why is it important to, um, uh, to, to, to have imagination being part of discussions and conversations about the development of a city? I, I think the imagination is uh, important to a city as much as imagination is important to our future. And uh, when we talk about the, the right to the city, we also need to talk about the right to our collective future. And I think that the moment you imagine something, um, you it, it, you can own it. And once you own it, you, uh, you can demand it uh, and you can make it happen or better than everything, you can craft it. So this is why I think that imagination itself, but also creating the spaces for imagination and allowing imagination to happen and emerge from these spaces is so important. Right. Basically creating what Gabi has, uh, has been doing all these years and what I'm trying to do as well is actually creating the infrastructure for imagination. And, and how do you do that? How do you create infra infrastructure for imagination? It is through, as I said, creating these um, these playgrounds where you invite people that are from different disciplines and um, by designing processes that are not um, that are not celebrating you know only the right the right decisions or the right um, actions or the right solutions but actually are celebrating um, through uh, creativity and through uh, and, and even in some cases failure but um, um, if you design a process and a, and, and a space where um, everything goes, um, but everything is also driven by, by a certain mission, then the, um, the chance that you end up with uh, solutions that are out of the box, that are interesting, that are actually you know gripping people by the by the throats and the hearts, and are uh, moving them forward to action is very very big. Mm. And it's it's also about um, um, deconstructing deconstructing certain bubbles where you can have like the same people having the same ideas, and by adding other people into the conversation, other solutions are being uh, uh, explored as well. Um, what's your what's your example of the your best case scenario where where it worked you know really well? Um, hmm. So I can um, I can say that the video that you just saw. Uh, is actually uh, the first winning concept from a format that we created that is called Labs, uh, where we bring in artists and we pair them together with technologists and we give them a weekend to come up with a solution to a specific human rights issue. So this exact video uh, is actually the idea of a um, team that is composed of a drummer and a software developer. Uh, and we, as Finax, um, produced it. Uh, and you can see that this is a completely novel um, and, and powerful approach to the issue of domestic violence and um, you know, the um, ominous silence that, uh, that surrounds domestic violence. Hmm. Um, we just talked about um, um, more solidarity or a sense of having more solidarity in order to, to change society. Um, is there a way that creativity can be involved um, in the ways of restructuring our, our own ideas of solidarity, especially if you consider the right of the city, that the right of the city now belongs to the wealthy. How can we change that around by using creativity? I can give you one example that is stemming from my um, you know, own path. Um, I used to be an investigative journalist um, before turning to activism. Um, I 
covered many different human rights topics, but one of my, um, my main focuses was the situation in institutions for people with intellectual and mental health disabilities across Eastern Europe. So uh, what I would do is I would go to these places undercover, and then I would um, try to expose the inhuman and degrading treatment uh, in these kind of warehouses for people where both kids and adults um, would spend their entire lives, uh, often in tremendous suffering. So as a journalist, I was on a mission uh, to close these places down. But despite all my efforts, um, I was able to close just one of these tens and tens of institutions that I, um, that I uh, visited uh, undercover. Uh, so fueled, you know, by, by frustration and uh, the obvious uh, lack of effectiveness of the journalism that I was experiencing, I moved to activism. Uh, and there I, I saw a very, very different um, issue, uh, which was a sector that was very stuck in its own way, old, you know, ways and um, um, really, uh, really afraid to, to experiment and really afraid to, to do something wrong. Uh, and I, but I realized at this point that we can't change today's, uh, today's issues with tools from the past. So this is what I did. I started uh, actually collaborating with creatives uh, and um, doing um, you know, different kind of uh, artistic interventions. And I just want to give you one example that would illustrate exactly your question. So the first collaboration with a creative that I did was I turned to um, uh, a graphic designer to illustrate the fact that um, illustrate the situation of uh, institutions for kid, kids with disabilities in Bulgaria. And so this, uh, this designer created an image that we placed on tens of thousands of postcards around the, around the country. Uh, and um, something that I, yeah, I, I can share is that from afar, this illustration looks uh, like a very cute children's drawing. But when you uh, would um, take it in your hands, you are, going, you are going to see that this is actually an infographic of the fact that 238 kids um, in institutions died from, uh, for, for the past 10 years, died from malnutrition, from hunger, from neglect. Um, and this, this image, this is what actually gripped people by the throat. This is what provoked people to act. This is what, um, this is what made them, you know, uh, made them want to demand change. But also, we gave them an actionable tool, so they only had to put, post, um, put a stamp on the back of the of the card. Uh, and all these uh, postcards were already pre-addressed to the Council of Ministers, and thousands and thousands of people. Um, sent these cards and in the end uh, it was this campaign it was this image that spiraled you know a much larger campaign that in the end ended to the closure of all all institutions for kids um, with uh, intellectual disabilities in Bulgaria all 25 of them and when we talk about imagination when we talk about creativity when we talk about you know creating this allowing uh, allowing imagination in spaces where it uh, it typically is not um, is not let in I think this is a great example of, um, of what we can achieve if we do that. Right. So it's it's creating awareness through uh, imagination and then providing people with certain tools so they can take this next step. So it's okay. it's involving that those those tools. Thank you so much for now, Jana. We will will return to you in a bit. But Gabriela, uh, I would like to go to you now because uh, you brought a short clip with you as well that you wanted to show mm -hmm. us, right? Mm -hmm. Shall we just look at the clip or shall Absolutely. we? Let's, let's look at it. A few days ago, I flew in a helicopter for the first time. I flew above Mexico City. I was born in Mexico City, and I am still fascinated by it. This size, this home, strangely and irrationally intimate to the body, yet the mind always a little bit lost. No edge, no middle, no end, no frame, lost. There is a phrase by Nietzsche that I love. For art to exist, for any aesthetic activity to exist, a certain physiological precondition is indispensable. Intoxication. 
I understand what he meant. Because to be intoxicated is to be beside oneself, or above, beyond the head, overcome, displaced, overwhelmed, losing control, lost. Lost to be found, lost and found, found to be lost again. Certain places and languages and expressions are beyond logical speculation and well-placed maps, beyond the literal. The process of true discovery is raw, malformed, uncomfortable, full of errors, yet life, almost too much life, unexpected. So how to invent spaces for experimentation, territories of unknowing, moments of confusion? How do we learn to unsee, to unsay, to unlearn, to erase? To disremember the order and logic and reason of things? To forget ourselves, to begin again, to make mistakes? Lost, with bare faith. Lost. Why did you want to show us this? So I, I thought... um. In these times at hand where I feel so much of our certainties have been displaced, mm -hmm. I remember this video that I did before my government time for a friend that was actually giving a conference and, and wanted me to add a voice into what were the creative possibilities of, of being lost. And so, first of all, I, I had the feeling as we were talking about the beginning that in this displacement, sometimes interesting possibilities emerge. And one of the things that I really think that we need to take into account looking over the last... 10, 20 years of our lives, if not more, is that in a certain sense, we pretended to be incredibly rational beings. And then we find ourselves voting in incredibly uh, strange presidents. And there's a conversation that we haven't finished unearthing completely. And that I think we were not able to look in the eyes because we were pretending to be such rational and logical creatures. So I actually think that there's another way that we need to go into these deeper conversations to come out again with different spaces. So you're talking about the importance of awareness, but I think it goes beyond that because one of the things that I think we're seeing right now is that information and awareness does not necessarily prompt right action. It doesn't necessarily prompt imagination. It doesn't necessarily prompt for a different reality to surface. So what needs to happen is for us to be emotionally engaged. Like we, we need to go into deeper layers of what it means to be human and how we have made meaning together. And this moment of feeling loss and of confusion, I think will be uh, where, where we can actually start reconsidering that or not, mm. unfortunately or fortunately. Yeah. It's interesting that what you say, because I think that um, the awareness is very important and empathy in that sense as well. But um, doesn't fear stand in the way of awareness and empathy? Because aren't people fearful to lose what they have or to lose their culture or to lose their, their possessions? Isn't, isn't fear the key thing to battle first? I mean, I think fear is definitely one of them, and, and I have uh, the feeling that that actually creates one of the biggest obstacles to, to joint understanding. But I, I also think that our, our biases um, are incredibly strong as well. You know, we, we so many times think that we have an objective view into reality, be it that we are professionally trained for a certain type of objectivity as journalists. And, mm -hmm. and for example, no, I, but that's actually true to a certain extent. So perhaps we actually need different tools to be thinking about empathy, to be thinking about not only mental, but also emotional awareness. And I do think that arts and culture has brought us a long way. I, I do think that having literature out there where you can step into somebody's reality, see a film and step into somebody's shoes has been a great prompter of these discussions. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I feel that we need to make... Um, even more interventions into that deep culture mm. of, again, like, who do we want to become? So it's fear, yes, but it's also our own biases. Mm -hmm. It's the metaphors we use. is language that creates worlds. It is our symbols and our rituals and our myths. Yeah. So how do we stop thinking about uh, our societies and our cities and ourselves as these these more, again, like rational as well as uh, the metaphors that we're using are, you know, downloading our brain and computer. And it's it's actually, no, like we are more like cultural artifacts, both collectively as well as individually. So how do we actually jump as well into those spaces but simultaneously? But because again, like hard data is necessary, but as, as Yana's video showed, which is why I find it so powerful. Like it's not that people didn't know those numbers. It isn't as if there was not policy that existed 
for men not to kill their 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 partners or their wives. I mean, this is the, obviously there's there's things put into place, but it wasn't enough. But but so what is enough basically, and where do we where do we intervene? I think is a question. Yeah, because uh, I think that the question of where where we would intervene is is important, but also there needs to be a willingness uh, for introspection to Absolutely. analyze our own behavior. And what I found interesting uh, with the Black Lives Matter discussions that you know that that followed up the the the, the, the demonstrations is that it wasn't about why people were standing there, why it was so globally, you know, adapted everywhere. It was whether the rules were applied there or whether people wanted to discuss. It was It was really difficult to have several societies in several countries to be introspectives of their own culture and their own structures. They closed the door and talked about something else. How can we turn that awareness around of being confronted with that information that protests are there and having some introspection to our own culture the same introspection that is been that is needed to you know intervene when a woman is being beaten you know how can we create that sense of urgency in order to have that introspection absolutely i think that is one of the fundamental questions and and in a certain sense knowing that we we are the good conversations in life will be work in progress forever. Mm. I don't think we will ever get to that final state or moment where we're like, oh yeah, humanity or me personally, we've or you personally, we've solved the world and solved life. But if we do go back to the fundamentals of how we make meaning um, and what are the ingredients of how historically as well as in the present that we've, we've made meaning, I think that we can then start exploring very different avenues. In terms of, you know, you mentioned Black Lives Matter, and I think Yana could perhaps also speak to that because she's been involved with several artists uh, working in the U.S. Um, I think that the, the the power of it, again, not only lies in information, but an, in a way of being in the world and an emotional engagement that was able to create concentric circles and that has been involving people from very different walks of life, but also very different disciplines. And this, I feel, is the great shift where it's no longer enough for one discipline, for one community, for one city, um, for government, for civil society, for it, it really is going to take all of us. Mm -hmm. So how do we start even thinking about that infrastructure of imagination, as, as Yana mentioned? How do we think about this participatory scaffolding? How do we have tough conversations? How do we know that our questions are open-ended? And mm. how do we travel into them every time deeper? I think are, are, are some of the questions that we need to start folding into our discussions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in a certain sense, this is why I find so important that at this point in time, governments are not only trying to do the right thing, but also thinking about how do we create these wider conversations because... Um, Yes, that th there are so many choices that we need to decide upon mm. in, in these moments. I I'd like to, to, to switch over to Jana, because uh, like you said, you're involved in activism as well. Um, how do you prevent people from shutting down as soon as they hear the word activism? Because that's what's happening in Holland. I mean, the people have the feeling that they don't want to discuss racism anymore because it has been discussed too much and it's only you know involved with with people that are involved with activism so it's not not in my backyard how do you change that perception around so it is my belief uh, that creative actions and creative collaborations can save the world and why it's not just stemming you know from my 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 own personal um, like history but also i'm currently researching what makes people care uh, and there are key conclusions from behavioral and the neuroscientists that include that opinions and this this refers to what you uh, said earlier um, opinions change not through more information but through compelling empathy inducing experiences uh, also, art, it is proven, art can trigger empathy um, and is one of the best um, ways to translate complex messages in a way that makes people care and compels them to act. Uh, something very important when we talk about you know, provoking an emotional response, again, science tells us that this should be done very, very carefully because people will shut down if you simply um, you know, evoke um, sadness or guilt or fear. Uh, and most importantly, um, campaigns that bring all and inspire hope are most effective. And here we can, again, like to turn to the point of, of 
you know, do we do we instill fear or do we instill hope in our campaigns? And I want to make a very brief note about the role of hope in um, in human rights campaigning and in activism. Uh, there is something that I swear by that is called hope-based communications. It is designed by the brilliant Thomas Coombs, um, and it basically is it also is based on uh, on uh, neuroscience and behavioral science. And it involves making five basic shifts in the way we talk about uh, human rights. But honestly, this can be applied to you know to, to any kind of uh, any kind of field. Uh, the first one is talk about solutions, not problems, because we we need to show our audience an alternative possibility of how the world can look. Uh, the other one is to uh, highlight highlight what we stand for and not what we oppose, because. We, Honestly, we tend to visualize uh, what we are against uh, and not we are not not what we are for. Uh, while the opposite is way way more more effective. Um, another another shift is um, uh, create opportunities and drop threats because the su successful movements in history uh, they're propelled forward by by enthusiasm and passion. Um, and we you can't generate lasting passion and enthusiasm purely uh, through outrage and disgust. Um, and then a couple of others that, that are really worth mentioning is that we need to empathize um, support for uh, heroes and not pity for victims, uh, even though uh, it's, it's a fault of the human rights movement that we have been doing the opposite uh, for quite a long time. And the last one, and it's so, so crucial, uh, to show that we got this. Because if we uh, all the time talk about human rights under siege, and it is true, but if we talk about this um, and uh, you know, if we, if we underline at, at every chance that we get that um, you know, we are under attack and we are demonized and we are you know, um, at, a, at a very um, like difficult position, this can um, inadvertently harm uh, the perceptions of the movement's effectiveness and we don't know don't want this. So this is why it's so important to bet, always bet on hope. Um, but, but can I ask a question about that? Because people, other activists would say you're gold plating everything by not concentrating on the problem, but concentrating on the positive sides of the, the, the issue that we have to deal with. You're gold plating it and you're not addressing the problem. We need to address the, 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 the issues with sometimes negativity because they are negative. What is your short reaction on that? It's, it's not about not mentioning the problems, it's about reframing them. Um, it is, it's, it's about not only talking about the problem, but to mention the problem and then give people an actionable point. point. It, this is solvable, this is possible, this is something that we can do together, this is how we can make it. Because very often, um, if you look at um, of human rights communication in the past, um, very often it we put a full stop after Oh, this is wrong. Um, but we we don't paint the picture of how we can we can achieve change um, together. So I think this is when we talk about hope. It's not. It's this doesn't mean do not mention the problem, not at all. But paint the picture of of how we can we can achieve change so that this problem is uh, turns into a solution. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, I have to say goodbye for now because we're, uh, we're nearing the end of the program. But thank you so much for your contribution, Anna. I hope to meet you in real life uh, in the near future as well. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you for the invitation. Um, Gabriela, we have to, we're almost at the end of the program. Um, it, it's interesting because you were here just as a stopover, but now you've been here for four months, if I'm, if I'm correct. Four months, yes. Um, what are your plans? Um, I'm having a Dutch baby now. Oh, <laughs> that happened quickly. <laughs> in terms of my, yes, in terms of my organization. So since I've been here um, and will be here for several months more, um, I, my organization now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be creating it here in mm. the Netherlands, even though it will be international in scope. Yeah. Uh, last year, I've been working with many cities, uh, Asia, Europe, uh, the Americas, et cetera, et cetera. But now it seems that it's going to be one of the bases is going to be here. Brilliant. So mm. we can have more of you in the near future. Yeah, hopefully so. Hopefully so. Great. Um, and to close off, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? It depends on the day. This, <laughs> this has been quite a roller coaster, I must say. Um, but I have the feeling that humanity many times when in deep crises has also surfaced 
a lot of its reserves of potential and of hope, that hope that Jana was speaking to. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a, a lovely book by Rebecca Solnit that actually mentions Mexico City after the earthquake. Yeah. And I do think that is it's well looking into those moments where we have resurfaced even stronger after a crisis even as, as I mean, this is a huge one, a humongous one. Mm. Uh, but I've also been very, just like very touched to see everything that has happened in the grassroots movement. And I, and I don't necessarily mean like formal activists only, like everything from neighbors helping neighbors, family members. And this is a, uh, this mutual aid, if you will, um, is a little bit also what I was pointing towards in my presentation, that I find that such a fascinating social articulation, if you will. Mm. But what we're needing right now is bigger structures to actually articulate that within itself. And for that, as Yana was mentioning, I do think that we need to start figuring out what that future that we, we want actually looks like, because that's sometimes where, where our eyesight stops of, of yeah. knowing everything we don't want, but how do we actually start speaking and creating a language yeah. and the vision for what it is that we do want together. And those and then, bigger structures have to be exactly. created together. And then we all know, what, we can all have a place in that conversation. Yeah. No? And, and there, there were some examples of Mexico City that on another occasion I will tell you about. But um, so it depends on the day, but mostly hopeful because I, I do think that um, something has been unearthed yeah. and that I'm hoping that that is what gathers momentum. But I do want to stress that it is and will be with this narrative breakdown, a culture battle. Yeah. And we really need to put energy into those visions and, and, and futures that we would like to see happen. Yes, and that needs a lot of work. But with inspiring people like you are, mm -hmm. I think that work will be a little bit easier because the structures that need to be built are being thought of by people do that possess that crea creativity mm -hmm. thank you so much thank you thank you well this is the end of this edition of we make the city reset every thursday this summer uh, at 8 30 at www.deswijger slash live a new broadcasts are being broadcast as well and next up is artist and writer charlie Kohlhaas on August 6th. Uh, the, the, the topic will be globalization, the changing nature of the city and multi multiculturalism in the face of a pandemic. Please join us for that from now. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>